Before we get started, I just want to share a couple of things with you guys um, as you're turning to James in the book of James this morning. Uh, yesterday, I had the um, privilege of sharing with about 75 or so other uh, ministers, uh, Baptist ministers down in China Lake early in the morning, <laughs> and I got to share with them about reaching out to the, to the community. And one of the things was, uh, uh, you know, why we need to do that. And I got to, to talking to, to my table, and they wanted to know more about it and about the work camp coming. And by the way, we have 440 vo volunteers right now coming, um, signed up. So we need your help locally. <laughs> um, but what was really neat was in that network, it, it got some of them so excited they want to help and come up here and help during the week. And these are all other main ministers. So that's really exciting that hopefully that it, it starts something that maybe will spread to other, other areas of, of the state. Um, another thing I just wanted to share with you as well was, I just might be, seem kind of small, but I, I see God's provision in it. This last Thursday, our Good News Club was canceled and I was disappointed because after school activities were canceled. But in God's providence, it was good it was canceled because it allowed me to be here and catch potential flooding that would have happened downstairs. Um, I was downstairs and I heard a gushing of water and I said, what is that sound? It sounds like a pipe broke, but it wasn't. The water dammed up outside the church from all the snow and it was coming in like a waterfall on this front wall here, just pouring in. I'd never seen anything like it. So I was able to quickly go outside and dig a trench and allow the water to escape, and I was able to clean up before it did any damage. So thank God that the Good News Club was canceled, because I wouldn't have not been here, and it probably would have come into about a foot or more so of water. So um, what seems disappointing on one end becomes God's provision on the other. So I just thought that was pretty awesome and encouraging to me, looking back at it. <laughs> that it, it actually, well, yeah, they thank God, but <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Well, we're in the book of James this morning, um, and in chapter 1, and we're going to, it's 1266 in your pew Bible, if you're using your pew Bible, and I'm actually going to just read to, uh, verse, to verse 8, and then we'll, we'll study a little bit more after that. So it says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith Develop us perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does." The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position, but the one who was rich should take pride in his low position because he will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the, and withers the plant. It blossoms, falls, and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you, Lord for this wonderful day. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for giving us your word. And right now, I pray you would just open up our hearts. Lord, I re pray that you reveal to us what you want us to learn and, and take away this morning. And I pray in your only precious name, Jesus. Amen. So since we didn't have um, services last week, I figured we could go twice as long this morning. Right? Is that okay, Pam? Is that, no. Okay, yeah. <laughs> That's a J thing. Oh. <laughs> all right, all right. So <laughs> the book of James is actually it's one of my favorite books in the Bible because one of the main reasons I like it is because it addresses uh, realities of life and the Christian life, and it doesn't really hold any punches when, when talking about it. And those of you that have come to know me uh, know that I, I kind of like that style. You know, just, just hit me with the truth. And, just, and sometimes it's kind of blunt and hard, but hey, I'd rather get it out there than beat it around the bush and, and, and uh, not tell the truth. But that, that's how James is, is writing here. He, he, he keeps hitting you again and again. And as, as we're going through these verses, you'll, you'll see what I mean. 
and it's, it's, a, it's a bit hard to deal with at, at times. I mean, you just look at the opening part of, of this letter. Verse 2 starts with a very interesting phrase. Consider it pure joy. Okay, great. Consider it pure joy. That, that's awesome. You know, it, that, that, that's our theme for today, and that phrase in itself sounds exciting. It sounds, it sounds great. But then we continue to read on after that, consider it pure joy. What do we consider it pure joy? Whenever you face trials of many kinds because the testing of your faith develops perseverance. What? Consider that pure joy? Okay. That doesn't sound joyous to me at all. Testing of my faith, trials, perseverance, all those words. Don't bring the images of joy in my mind. As a matter of fact, it sounds more like the opposite of, of joy. It sounds like suffering. It sounds like work. But this is what it says here in the Word of God, and, and we can't ignore it just because it's hard to read. So why do we have, have trials? Well, before... We can answer that question. We need to face another question. Am, am I willing to hear God's answer? Am I willing to embrace God's answer to these questions? Because some of the answers that God gives are really hard pills to swallow, but they're still God's answers. And I want to urge each of you that you be willing to tell God this. There, there are things in my life are too hard, and I'm not sure I want to hear what you have to say. But, Lord, I can't go on like I have been. So I'm, I'm willing for you to make me willing. If you choose to not change my circumstances, then I pray that you change me. So uh, as I rarely established... The opening part of this, this book is, is kind of difficult. It's, 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 it's an outrageous statement. Consider it pure joy. Well, let's look at the first two words. Consider it. This, this means that we're to really ponder this idea. This probably is a new idea, right? All of our effort, all of our concentration needs to now, okay, they're telling us to consider it. Consider what? Let, let's get into this. We're going to go through this and, and have a conclusion here. And, and the tense here, it, it conveys a sense of, of urgency. When you're speaking with somebody, consider this idea. Think about this. We're, we're, we're to weigh our, our trials. We're to weigh and calculate our, our worries. And we're to put them into perspective. Dr. Warren Wiersbe of, of Moody Bible Institute says this of our mindset and trials. says, our values determine our evaluations. If we value comfort more than characters, then trials will upset us. If we value the material and physical more than the spiritual, we would not be able to count it all joy. If we live only for the present and forget about the future, the trials will make us bitter, not better. I think I've been stuck in that mode a few times and we just look at the circumstances. And I was mopping up the floor downstairs. I was like, come on. <laughs> How much water could possibly have come out? It was a lot. So to help us with this, we, we need to recognize, though, why are we here to begin with? Why are we on planet Earth? Why did God make us? And in, in our Sunday school class, that, that, that I've been um, facilitating over the last few weeks. We started a series, Dust to Glory, by Dr. R.C. Sproul. And in the second class we had, he discussed that we were made with a purpose in, in God's image. See, we, we must understand this, that from the very beginning of creation, we had purpose, that God gave us purpose, that we are not here for our pleasure, but that we're actually here for God's purpose. 
And we're not here to find happiness. We're here to seek holiness. Whatever the case is, however you may be living, you may be going through. Maybe you're, you're going through a hard time financially. Maybe you have a rebellious child or grandchild in your life. Maybe you're fighting some mental illnesses, like depression. Maybe there's some marital problems. But in, in all situations, no matter what trials or hardships we're going through, we have the opportunity to shine for Christ while we're in it. It's consider it pure joy, it says. And there, there are multiple passages in Scripture that tell us that we can find jubilation in the times during the times of, of tribulation. First Peter chapter 4, verse 13 tells us, But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of, of glory and of God rest on you. This is something I need to practice. I need to turn my whining into worship. Right? I need to look at my circumstances through a different lens, through a God lens. We, as, as we, saw, we sang that song, Thrive, right? We, we need to go from just surviving to thriving in Christ. And the only way we can do this is to keep our focus on God and not on our problems and to understand that we are here for God's purpose, for His purpose, and not our own purpose and pleasure. In other words, joy in trials comes from knowing that the outcome will ultimately be positive. In the end, it's going to be a good outcome. Now, how many of you guys have read the Declaration of Independence? The whole thing, yeah. All right? it's, it's an amazing piece of, of, of writing. Right? I have some personal concerns with some of it, but that's another, another topic. But one of the areas I wish they worded differently, and th these were young guys in their 20s writing it, so they hadn't experienced a lot, but they knew what they wanted. One of the things I think that's very well known is, is that our, cr our Creator gave us certain unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of Can you see why I have a problem with that? Who defines what's happiness? Maybe happiness is having an abortion in the ninth month of your pregnancy. That was just passed in New York. Up to the minute of birth, they're allowed to end the life of the child for the supposed health of the mother or if the baby might die. I'm like, if the baby's going to die, let it be born and let it die outside the womb. That's the pursuit of man's happiness. Or maybe the pursuit of happiness is doing what you want, how you want, no matter the consequences. That's the pursuit of your happiness. Now, I, I don't think our, finding, our founding father's thought these things when they wrote it, but I, I wish they said this instead, that, that we had the right to pursue the joy in our Creator. And we have that right. Why? Because often we equate happiness with joy, but those two are totally different. They are different because they come from different sources. Happiness comes from things happening to us, our surroundings, our circumstances. That drives our happiness. Joy comes from the Holy Spirit and who God is. He is unchanging. He is stable. He will always be the same as He was yesterday, today, tomorrow, and forever. Hence, our joy our anchor in that joy will never change. Our surroundings may change. 
Our circumstances may change, and so our happiness ebbs and flows, but our joy is rooted in who God is or should be. All right? Happiness, things, what's happening to me? We, then we find if our circumstances are unfavorable, then we are unhappy. Joy, real joy, comes from God. And that only comes from when we study who he is, we study his word, and we begin to surrender our lives to him. Control. We understand, God, I want this joy. That peace that passes all understanding comes from that joy, understanding who God is. This way, when, when trials come and, and, and our circumstances and, and the, uh, the storms of this world come, we can still have joy through all of it. I am going to find a way to trust in him even though I'm not seeing him right now. So often we ask, where is God? Some of the hardships feel too hard to bear. He's there. We can have joy in just knowing that he's there. So the next phrase is, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Some other translations say, fall into trials. This is such an, an honest perspective of what actually happens here. Fall into trials, right? If we could see a trial coming, we wouldn't walk into it, would we? I wouldn't, willfully, right? So we kind of just like fall into them kind of trap set into ground and we just, here's a trial. We get out of that one. Here's another one. That's the way it happens. But once we were down in this, in this trial, in this hole, there's only one way to look and that's to, to look up. Look up to the one and the only one who carry us out of it. And it says, of, of many kinds. And it's actually the same description that is used when describing Joseph's coat of many colors. Each trial is, is distinct and different from the other. That's why it's not good to be jealous of someone else's trial. Like, oh man, if I just had their trial, it'd be so much better than mine. Like, it's still a trial. And God's teaching them something that maybe you already learned. When, when, when I begin training for a, a marathon, I, I set up my, my training schedule four months in advance because I have to get ready for this marathon. I use a program to set up my schedule and I, I put in my level of fitness, how many marathons I've run before, what my average mileage is, all this information. And when I do that, not one time has my schedule ever been the same. My training schedule fluctuates according to my ability, right? Each time that I, that I train. Now, there are others that I know, some friends who might run the same marathon as me, and they are training as well. And we can talk about our training, but our runs on specific days are completely different. So while we're aiming at the same goal, same end, our training is a little bit different to get us ready to meet that goal. And that's the same way it is with the Christian walk, right? We're, we're all heading in the same direction. But God kind of gives us this customized training schedule that we're going to walk through. What God sends me through, he might not send you through. You might not learn anything from it, or you might have... Or you might be good in that area already. It's okay. But we all know we're, we're going through it. And so in that, in the broad scope, we encourage each other because we all know we're training and we're going for that race. But I must do it, and no one else can do it for me. We all have different strengths and different weaknesses, and we all need to grow in different areas of our face. face. So each one is this, this customized training program. That's how, how I look at it. So first here, it's a pretty long introduction, but I'll, I'll go through the last part fairly quickly. Trials bring good from bad and give you strength. Let's look now at, at verse 3. 
It says, because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance. The, the word testing here actually is referring to how precious metals are, are how they become purified, right? They, they go through a refinement. They're stuck in the fire. Well, the fire doesn't consume them. It superheats them so that the impurities can come to the top and they can be removed. A couple of Saturdays ago, in the men's breakfast, I shared from Zechariah chapter 13, verses 8 to 9. And it, it reads, right, that two-thirds, it's talking about the remnant of Israel. It says two-thirds of Israel will be destroyed. And last, the last third is going to be saved. And then you know what it says is that he's going to do with the last third? He's going to send them through the refining fire. He's going to test them. You would think two-thirds is gone. This is my special third. I'm going to protect them, make sure nothing happens to them. They're nice and safe. He says, no, you survived. Welcome to the fire. And that's the same thing with us, but he does it because he loves us and he's refining us and making us better, making us stronger, making us purer. And in the refining, it's going to get a bit hot. And it's not going to be very comfortable. And it might hurt at times, but we will not perish. We will be purified. And then the word James, the word James uses for, for, tri, produce, tri, uh, for trials produces perseverance. Right? This can be translated to patience and endurance. And, and I found an interesting piece of information on this. The, the Greek word here comes from two words. One means to remain and the other means under. For perseverance. Remain under. So the testing and refining your faith produces the ability to remain under. Does that sound pleasant to anybody? Unless it's under my blankets in the morning. That's fine. Well, I think it's about remaining under a heavy, oppressive weight. Right? This is counter to how most of us react to try. We want to run away. We want to get away from it. This hurts too bad. Get me out of here, God. Right? But, but quitting and trying to escape, it, it cuts short the good that God is trying to bring into our lives. He wants to bring the good from the bad. The pressure squeezing out the bad. There was a survey done that I read online of 100 people, and they were asked what they would rather do instead of sticking with it. And here are the top four answers. First is they want to complain. How many guys complain? Yeah, I do. I know. All you complain, shans be going up. <laughs> I was complaining, mopping up that water. All right, this is an this is an easy thing that we we all do, and it feels like the more that we can suffer, the more that people can suffer with us, the better it feels, right? Like, oh, they understand. Oh, Mike, I got a listening ear finally. Now it's nice to complain. Or or we or we lash out, right? This is often the, the horrible consequence, right, that we end up hurting those that are closest to us when we lash out, when we're under this pressure. Or we want to bail. We want to just get out. We want, to be, we want it to end quickly, whether it be a relationship or a marriage or a job. Or we want to cut off ties with a child because they're just getting too difficult. When things seem to get difficult, we say, let's, let's just cut that and we're done. We're done. That thought has gone through my mind. Or we say, take me out. I don't want to cut, I want to remove myself from the situation. I, I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to be in existence anymore. Life is just way too hard. God, let it end. Or 
all of these can have legitimate weight to them. But when we are in the midst of these trials, we need to cling to who we know holds true, God, our Savior, and we need to keep our eyes fixed on him. And we have each other to encourage each other as we're going through that. But trials also bring transformation in our life. Once, once we learn to persevere, we can begin to see our life transforming. Read verse 4 here with me. Chapter 1, verse 4 of James is, Perseverance must finish its works that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. The idea here is that perseverance brings us to where God actually wants us to go. If we persevere under pressure, we will become mature. Now, this is not some self-help guide I'm saying here, some type of hard discipline we got to make ourselves go through. This is what God's saying. Like, he wants to make us spiritually mature. He wants to make us strong so that, so that he can continue to use us for his glory. Again, this is not for us. This is for him. But he loves us, and he knows it's, it, it does work out good for us. Now, now most immature people I, I know are the ones who cannot persevere, the, the ones who do not finish anything they start. They cut it short. They start something, and they don't finish. They start a book. They don't finish reading it. Right? They, they, they start a project, they don't finish. One of my pet peeves driving a lot of times to this day, I see houses half done. I'm like, would you finish it already? <laughs> it's been 17 years. <laughs> but immature people, people not mature into faith, they just quit. They leave. They say the church has gotten too hard. I'm going to leave, go to someplace else where it's not as difficult. Right? This, this trait is normally found in a child. That's why they say they're immature. As you're training your child, you, you, you learn, you teach them to persevere through things. As they persevere, they understand that's growth, right? How many kids, how many adults here liked being in school, liked every subject and enjoyed it every day? Besides my wife, I know she did enjoy it. <laughs> but I didn't, right? But my, did my parents let me quit? No. And if they had, they wouldn't have been good parents. Even the state would have viewed them as bad parents. They knew it was for my maturity and for my growth. I needed to persevere through things that I didn't like. And if you, want, if you and I want to be mature, we must trust God and learn how to stay under the suffering, right? Only those who go through these messes will eventually become mature. This last marathon that I finished, that, that, that I raced, I, di I didn't finish it. I didn't, I didn't finish the race. And while it was a bit humbling, at the time, it felt like the right decision. When, when looking back, though, I figured out what went wrong? Why did I quit? Because the, the feeling to quit came on so quickly, and it started after I, I started to race so, so strong. But I, I look back to, so, so I, I could learn from it and not make that same mistake again. And I, and I look back, and I made some few critical mistakes that I could not easily overcome. One, was I didn't intake enough water. I wasn't sustaining my body. Because it was so cold out, my body wasn't calling for water in the normal dry mouth sense. It, it was calling for water in my joints. <laughs> Instead, I didn't read those signs and I didn't drink the proper water. The next mistake I made was I became comfortable with my environment. I was wearing so many layers, I became warm. So I thought I could take some of these layers off. Bad mistake, because when I became cold again, those layers were now frozen. Instead of warming me up, they added cold to my body. So when I came to the second loop and the run now got a whole lot harder, a loop that I just did, I just accomplished this loop thinking in my prideful mind, oh, I could do it again. But it was a lot more difficult. People weren't there on the route to support me. I was now cold. 
the sun was setting, the wind was hitting me, and all my joints hurt. So I quit. Why? Because I let my guard down. I wasn't disciplined when I needed to be disciplined with the intake of my water. And I lost the awareness of my surroundings because I came, became way too comfortable with that. And the same thing can happen to us in our spiritual lives. As we are going through parts of our lives that seem easy, we tend not to read the Bible as much or commune with God as much as we need to. We maybe decide not to wear the full armor of God. I don't need the shield of faith right now. I don't need the breastplate of righteousness. I don't need the belt of truth. Let's take them off. They're kind of heavy. You relax. Then difficulties strike. And our first thought is to quit because we are not ready for those times. Now, finishing the race, if I kept those things on, I drank water, I kept, it still would have been hard to finish the race, but I would have been able to finish it. And same thing with us. That's why we have daily devotions. We're supposed to. That's why we're supposed to be committed to God's word and study. So when the hard times come, we are well anchored and not wanting to quit. Third, God gives wisdom to help us understand. James 1.5 is one of those verses that gets quoted a lot, but in the process, it gets taken out of context. And let me remind you that we've been learning to consider it pure joy this morning, right? When we face trials and we focused on some of the things that, that the trials actually produce in our lives, that's what we've looked at so far. God is promising here that he will give wisdom when we're wondering why we are going through such things, right? It says, if any of you lacks wisdom and put it into context, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and will be given to him, right? Because when you're going through the trials, that's when you ask God, why am I going through this? That's when he gives you the wisdom because I want you to grow, he says. I want you to persevere through it. A lot of times we ask God for wisdom, but we don't want the trials where the wisdom can come from. And it says God gives generously. He gives generously to all with, without finding fault. Wisdom re refers to the ability to judge correctly and then to follow that with correct conduct. We should judge our trials correctly and understand we need to persevere through them, knowing that God loves us and will carry us through. God gives generously. This is in the present tense, which shows that God just keeps giving and giving and giving and giving. God gives graciously. Notice that when God gives wisdom, he's not out to find fault with us and gives to all without playing favorites or bestowing wisdom just on a few. No, he wants, if you ask, in the midst of trials, ask God, God, give me the wisdom, the understanding of why I'm going through this. He will give it to you. We need to ask God for wisdom. We need, to, we need wisdom in our trials so that we will not waste our trials and miss what God wants to teach us. Ask him for staying power. Ask him for perseverance, even while you are suffering right now. And finally, I just have just the point of this up here because just this point alone carries a lot. Believe God, do not doubt. Believe God, do not doubt. You just write that down. You took nothing else from this morning. That will carry you through a lot. Believe God, do not doubt. We read this in verse 6. Says, but when he asked, he must believe and not doubt because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. Doubts are powerful. They can make us change our mind. They can make us do things we didn't plan on doing. Make us have decisions that we make in an instant that we regret later on. Doubts can make you question things that should not be questioned. Like if God's still there. And doubts can keep away the answer of wisdom that God has for you. If you and I don't really want to stand up under and know how it is, what is it God wants, verse 7 and 
and A is like a slap in the face and a good wake-up call. It says, that man, the one who doubts, should not think he will receive anything for the Lord, from the Lord. Do you really want wisdom? Then you must be willing to receive whatever God wants to do in you. Trials, especially trials, are included there. Then we get to verse 8, and the slap continues. He says, he is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. Do not doubt God. A doubter is like someone with two souls, someone who is trying to have their cake and eat it too. They want it both ways. It's what the world often has. They want it both ways. They want the good without the cost. This person might say things like, I want what God wants, but I don't want what he wants in my life. Or I want to grow, but I also want to complain about the growth. Or I want to get better, but I kind of like staying bitter. I, I want to learn, but I don't want it to be hard. I want to be reconciled, but I also want to see the other person suffer. When we're conflicted like this, we end up becoming very unstable people. This word was used to describe one who was unsettled, one who was unsteady, staggering, and really like a drunken man. When you doubt, you're compared to being a drunken man in your belief. Someone once said that if your heart and mind are divided, trials will tear you apart. Don't doubt, because the trials will come, and either you'll grow or you'll be destroyed. If trials can grow us as, right, if, if personal trials can grow us as individuals, how much more spiritual trials can, can grow us? Someone once asked C.S. Lewis, why do the righteous suffer? To which he replied, why not? They're the only ones who can take it. So as you are suffering and going through trials, remember, consider it pure joy. And I will end with this reading of verse 12, because here is where the hope is found in verse 12. And the promise to all who persevere through the trials and don't doubt God. It says, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. What an awesome reward and promise that is left for us who persevere through these trials. Amen? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you again, Lord, for who you are. Thank you for giving us the Holy Spirit so that in our times of growth, we can lean on you, Lord. Pray that you continue to spur us on towards good works. That we would be disciplined in our lives to study your word. Lord, not for our own growth or our own benefit, Lord, but for your glory. I pray that we can have the discipline to get to know you and to make you known in every area that we enter, in our communities, in our homes, in our workplaces, Father God. And I thank you again, Lord, for giving us all that you have, for being patient and gracious and merciful with us each and every day. And I pray this all in your holy, precious name, Jesus. Amen.